This reading is from Zephaniah chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, during the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both men and animals. I will sweep away the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. The wicked will have only heaps of rubble when I cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place every remnant of Baal, the names of the pagan and the idolatrous priests, those who bow down to, on the roofs to worship the starry host, those who bow down and swear by the Lord and who also swear by Molech, those who turn back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him. And now we move on to Zephaniah chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. The sorrows for the appointed feasts I will remove from you. They are a burden and a reproach to you. At that time I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame and gather those who have been scattered. I will give them praise and honour in every land where they were put to shame. At that time I will gather you. At that time I will bring you home. I will give you honour and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome to this first talk in our Lenten series. Why did I choose these particular prophets? Well, the first reason is that they deserve to be better known. Our lectionary of readings gives scant attention to them. And had you asked me a month ago about the message of Obadiah or Joel, I would have to truthfully reply that all I knew about either of them could be written on the back of a matchbox. Secondly, all five prophets wrote and spoke at a time when change was on the horizon or in which events had occurred that would inevitably affect the future. Between the autumn of 1348 and 1349, the Black Death hit this country and between a third and a half of the population died. Agri agriculture that was labour intensive could no longer be sustained and huge tracts of the countryside were devoted to pasture and a concentration on sheep. People moved away from their village, so it's quite common in Norfolk, for example, to see a church standing a mile outside the village. Eventually, refugees from the Low Countries settled in Britain and taught us the art of turning raw wool into finished goods and moved us out of a primary economy to a manufacturing nation. It also heralded the end of feudalism as working men discovered that they could earn a better living by moving away. I believe we're living at a time in which so much of what we have taken for granted is bound to change. I believe that the prophets that we will study have something to say to us. And finally, 
if you have wondered why the notes are so fulsome, it's because I hope that you will read and reread them in between each session so that they become familiar friends to each of us. And after each talk, there is a hymn, and you'll see that you have a separate leaflet to sing along with the organ. Zephaniah prophesied during the reforms of King Josiah, 640 to 609 BC, who brought spiritual revival to Judah after the long and disastrous reign of Manasseh. Zephaniah pronounced God's judgment on corruption and wickedness, but also his plan to restore Judah. He spoke of the coming day of the Lord, when sin will be punished, justice would prevail, and a remnant of the faithful would be saved. That comes from the introduction to Zephaniah found in the English Standard Version. So session one, the day of the Lord. As I read the three chapters of the prophet Zephaniah, I find myself looking back to Genesis 6 and verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And the Lord was sorrow, sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. After introducing the word of the Lord to Zephaniah, who lived in the days of Josiah, king of Judah, we launch into this theme. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. So the day of the Lord is a recurrent theme in Zephaniah. The day of the Lord is near, verse 7. The great day of the Lord is near, nearer and hastening fast, verse 14. The day of the anger of the Lord, chapter 2 and verse 2. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. 3 and verse 11. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands hang limp. So the tone of God's seeming relentless anger in uh, chapters 1 and 2 and 3 verse 1 to 8 is superseded by conversion, restoration and rejoicing. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt you with loud singing. So, what's happening here? Well, when God is angry, his anger is entirely pure and completely justified. Human anger is never unsullied. It's always tainted by envy, jealousy, covetousness, self-preservation and every kind of calumny. Furthermore, the further we move away from God's truth and revelation, the nearer we move towards idolatry and God's created in our own image, reflecting our own spiritual and ethical blindness. When human beings stop believing in God, they do not believe in nothing, but in anything that takes their fancy. The name Zephaniah means hidden God, or can mean God has hidden himself, or that Zephaniah has been hidden by God. Zephaniah is the only prophet who traces his ancestry back four generations. Hezekiah, the last good king of Judah, was his great-grandfather. So Zephaniah was of royal blood. During the evil king Manasseh's reign, royal offspring were being sacrificed to the god Molech. And it's quite possible that Zephaniah may have been hidden by his mother, 
so that he would avoid the slaughter. Since the time of Hezekiah, the nations had drifted further and further away from God. Idolatry was rife, and the site for child sacrifice was Gehenna, a valley just south of Jerusalem, cursed by the prophet Jeremiah and used as a picture of hell by our Lord Jesus. Idolatry leads to immorality, and Manasseh also introduced astrology and spiritual mediums. He reigned 55 years, and under him corruption slipped downhill to an appalling low. Manasseh was succeeded by King Ammon, who was assassinated after only two years, and succeeded by Josiah, eight years old. Zephaniah's great concern was to prevent the kingdom of Judah from being exiled because of their sin, as the northern kingdom had. In the Old Testament, God's own people, the Jews, were called to be signposts and witnesses and encapsulating what it would mean to live under God's redeeming love. They were called to be a magnet that would draw kings and rulers around them and to see what God can do through a holy nation. This is how Isaiah puts it. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to that mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. So what a travesty we find in Zephaniah 1. Luke 12, verse 48, reads, From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. And of Israel, God writes in Amos 3 and verse 1, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family they brought out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth, Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Now, God is wonderfully patient with our misdemeanours. John Dunn, 1572 to 1631, one time Dean of St Paul's, in one of his poems, writes this. Wilt thou forgive that sin by which I won others to sin and made my sin their door? Wilt thou forgive that sin which I did shun a year or two, but wallowed in a score? And the answer is yes. As Charles Wesley puts it, the vilest offender may turn and find grace. Now human weakness is one thing, but a determined rejection of God's word and the willful embracing of ways that are contrary to his clear teaching is another. There was a gap of 70 years following the death of King Hezekiah in which there was there were no word of prophecy. Zephaniah's emphasis, 23 times mentioned, of the day of the Lord makes it abundantly clear that the day of the Lord is a day of reckoning. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 reads, The Lord is not slow about, can show about his, his promises, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Well, that's wonderful. But God's patience is not a signal to any of us to delay repentance. In the time of Isaiah, God spared Jerusalem. Time and time again, in the face of invasion and siege from Assyria. But in the time of Jeremiah, it fell. This time, 
to the armies of Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings and let me dwell with you in this place. Do not trust to these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? Zephaniah's prophecy in chapter 1 addressed to all the nations surrounding Judah. They will be judged for their attitude to Judah. But it's here a double-edged sword because God uses them to discipline Judah. For 700 years to the reign of King David, the Philistines, for example, harried and bullied the people of Israel. Children never enjoy being disciplined. They hate sitting on the naughty step. But an uncorrected child becomes a spoilt adult. God corrects and disciplines to our good. Finally, God longs to bless. God doesn't give us what we deserve, which is judgment, but what we do not deserve his mercy. Listen to these wonderful words from Romans eleven, twenty-two. Note carefully then that God is both kind and severe. He is severe to those who have fallen, but he is kind to you, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. Yet, we can only marvel at the patience and long-suffering of God. Zephaniah 3 verses 1 to 8 show us so clearly of how intrepidly opposed are the people of Judah to God's correction. Over and over again, God hopes that people will have a change of heart, like the prodigal son in Luke 15, where we are told he came to himself, which must mean that he had a kairos moment. He woke up to the person that he had become. And he realised that he had, had to turn back. Uh, he turned his back on his father's great love, being completely insensitive to his father's feelings, taking his inheritance but without thought of the consequences and has squandered everything and could only return home penniless. Zephaniah 3, 7 shows that God's hopes were shattered. I said, surely this city will hear me? It will accept corruption, correction? It will not lose sight of all that I have brought upon it? But they were the more eager to make their deeds corrupt. Yet, as always, God has the final word. As the presumption of the people in Genesis 11 led to the construction of the Tower of Babel, and God confounded their arrogance and pride by confusing the languages of the earth, so in Zephaniah 3.9, he looks forward hundreds of years to Acts 2, the day of Pentecost. At that time, I will change the speech of the people's to a pure speech, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. So, in the face of disobedience and self-destruction, God yet reserves a remnant of faithful people to himself who give fresh hope for the future. Despite everything, the little book of Zephaniah ends in triumph. At that time I will gather you, at that time I will bring you home. I will give you honour and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Well, I've left you a couple of questions to ponder, but I want to just um, give a very brief um, reflection at the end of this talk. Our opening introduction 
from the English Standard Version says, Zephaniah prophesied during the reign of King Josiah. And what is so tragic about this is that Josiah was one of the most godly, wholehearted and courageous kings in the Old Testament. And from the age of eight, he began to seek after God. And at the age of 26, he initiated a root and branch reform of the corrupt and evil practices in Judah. In so doing, he acted against the tide, <clears throat> so that this did not, in general, result in repentance and renewal across the nation. Zephaniah feared the longer-term results of this tragic deterioration in the life of his people. During the lockdown period, Agnes and I have watched a, a number of films each week from Talking Pictures TV <clears throat> and featuring mostly films made in the 1940s to the 1960s. Apart from seeing almost everyone smoking in these films, we would have to say that there is a complete absence of foul language, blasphemy, explicit sexual scenes and violence. From the 1960s onwards, there's been an increasing marginalisation of the Christian faith and a huge falling away in church attendance. A couple of days ago, I received an email telling me that my computer has been hacked and that if I do not pay $1,750 in the next three days, all the pornographic material that I am supposed to have downloaded will be disclosed to all my contacts. Well, having deleted this email, I'm bound to ask, how many people are slaves to this kind of pornography? It was not Judah alone who were challenged in terms of their behaviour, but the lands around them. And whenever we look around the world today, we see frustration and anger uh, against injustice, whether it be Russia, Hong Kong, China, Myanmar, the terrible things in the Yemen, and suffering caused by mismanagement in Zimbabwe and Venezuela. Let's have a prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that when you act in judgment, you also act in mercy. And so we thank you for your amazing love and patience. As we think of Zephaniah and the challenge that he gives to us, a challenge to live in the, the light of your truth, a challenge to repent of those things which are against your own will and purposes. We pray for our nation and pray at such a time as this that you quicken and revive your church, that we may be as light shining out in the midst of the darkness. For Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat>